Hi, everyone. Welcome to our tech talk with Dr. Ron Westrom. Uh, Dr. Westrom has a PhD in sociology and is an emeritus professor of sociology at Eastern Michigan University. Um, if you're not familiar with Dr. Westrom, he has written several books. Um, I've started some of them. I haven't finished others and I've ordered some. So mm -hmm. Complex Organizations, uh, Growth, Struggle and Change is one of his books. Uh, Technologies, The Shaping of People and Things in Society. And then Sidewinder, Creative Missile Development at China Lake. So lots of, lots of fun tidbits in all of those. He's also written several papers, but the ones that stick out here as of late are uh, three, the three cultural models, which is how most of us would know him, as well as the study of information flow, a personal journey. Uh, and that will play into our talk today for sure. He has been active in both the aviation and medical safety communities, just using his knowledge of sociology and culture to help keep those industries working safely. Uh, and then if you, if you didn't know any of that, I hope maybe you know that uh, Dr. Westrom was referenced in the book Accelerate, which uh, introduced most of us to the Dora metrics. And then he's also been on Gene Kim's podcast, The Ideal Cast on IT Revolution. So if you haven't heard that, you should go check it out. Um, so today he's going to talk to us about organizational change, leadership, and the flow of communication as the key to cultivating generative cultures. Thank you, Brandy. So um, our talk today is going to be about information flow cultures. Okay, so the first question is, of course, what the devil is organizational culture? Next. So organizational culture is essentially a whole bunch of different things. First of all, it's practices. It's also thoughts. It's also feelings and symbols. Next. So while all these are important, Let's use another index, and that is the flow of information. Next. So why do we pick information flow? Because first of all, information flow is the lifeblood of organizations. And second of all, information is also a powerful index of how an organization functions. It predicts other things. Next. So an information flow culture reflects how managers shape values and behavior. Next. So we're going to describe three different information flow types. The first is generative information flow, where you get a high flow of information, very effective use of the information the organization has. Then there is bureaucratic uh, sort of medium flow of information. And finally, we have pathological, which is the worst. And uh, there's a very low flow of information and a lot of bad information behavior. Next. So let's look at this pathological flow of information and see what is it that characterizes a pathological flow. Well, first of all, cooperation is bad. Uh, there's a high level of conflict. Um, the emphasis in pathological cultures is essentially taking care of the leaders. They think the organization is about them. There are strict boundaries. Messengers are shot. There's low creativity. Next. So really what we have is a toxic environment. And unfortunately, many of us work in toxic environments, so we know exactly what we're talking about here. Toxic environments are bad for your mental health. They're certainly bad for your physical health as well. Next. Whereas in a bureaucratic environment, um, we get modest cooperation. There's a lot of emphasis on rules and regulations and a problem with silos. Messengers are tolerated rather than uh, shot um, and conflicts are tamped down. Creativity is allowed, but not necessarily encouraged. 
Next. So I love this slide. This is a perfect example of how you expect bureaucratic information flow to work. Next. So generative information flow is the best. Uh, you get very high cooperation and by the way, trust, uh, an emphasis on the mission. Everybody's willing to put their particular concerns in relationship to what the mission is. Uh, a boundaryless organization, which is a wonderful idea. Uh, speaking up is encouraged. We have psychological safety, which according to uh, the Aristotle study is the most important thing in having good teams. And we have high creativity. Next. So this is the kind of my vision of generative information flow. Uh, one of the star, I think this is Star Trek Enterprise. Um, but I, I like the, the vision of how things should go. A lot of emphasis on expertise and knowledge rather than power and control. Next. So let me emphasize one of these features, psychological safety. The Aristotle project at Google studied what made for an effective team. The number one feature of an effective team according to the study was psychological safety. This is the ability to speak your mind without fear of punishment. When communication is easy, there's more of it. Next. It's also the right kind of communication. I like to say that a high flow of communication has these characteristics. It is timely, it is easy to understand, and it meets the receiver's needs. Next. So here's an example of generative communication. During the famous Redstone rocket project, one of NASA's first, a prototype went off course and crashed. Werner von Braun, head of the project, tried to figure out by many analyses what had happened. The analyses did not suggest a cause. Now they were gonna to have to start from scratch to redesign the missile. But then an engineer came to von Braun and he said, I think I did it. But how, von Braun wanted to know. Next. Well, said the engineer, I touched a part of the circuit with a screwdriver and I got a spark. I checked and circuit seemed to be fine, but maybe that was the problem. Well, it turned out that that was the problem. So the problem was solved and Von Braun sent the engineer a bottle of champagne. So what would happen in your organization when an engineer admits to making such a big mistake? Next. Generative cultures are often found in high performance organizations. They are common in high reliability systems that require greater cooperation for success. They are typical of elite military units whose cooperation is legendary, like for instance, the Navy SEALs. They are often seen in consumer and service industries when exceptional consumer satisfaction is the goal. And interestingly enough, they are often led by technological maestros. Next. So just a word about these technological maestros. This is not my concept. It was coined by Arthur Squires in a book uh, called The Tender Ship about technical leadership in World War II. And it meant the top leaders had these characteristics. Technical virtuosity, a high energy level, an ability to grasp the key questions, an ability to grasp the key details, high standards, and a hands-on attitude. Next. So here's an example. In June 1978, an engineering student called an architect named William Le Maisurier, who designed key parts of the City Corps building in downtown New York. The 57 floor building had an unusual footprint. And the student wanted to know whether the building was stable or not. Was it going to be stable in a high wind? Le Maisurier assured the student that it would be stable, and he had personally designed a special mass damper on the top floor to study it. But then he had a second thought, and that thought was that if the building was built according to specifications, there would be no problems. But had it actually been built that way? Next. So Le Maisurier called the builder. Well, the builder said they had pretty much followed the plans that they'd been given, he said, but 
There was one detail that was different. They had used rivets instead of welds to hold the building together. On a short building, this would not matter. But on a 57 story building, a quartering wind strong enough would bring down the building. How often would such a wind show up? About every 16 years turned out to be the answer. So they had to fix it. Next. They told the newspapers about it, but asked them to hold the story. So for several months after the secretaries had gone home at night, contractors pulled off the wall panels and welded the girders together. After they fixed the structural problem, then the newspapers published what had happened. Oh, by the way, what is requisite imagination? Requisite imagination is the fine art of anticipating what might go wrong. So here is a prime example of requisite imagination. And remember, mastering the key details is one trait of a maestro. Next. So maestros build generative information flow, and this creates the complex web that allows the organization to build things. Next. So let's see how this works in how Boeing creates airliners. Next. Well, building airliners is big business, very big business. Next. And I have a law, and the law says the higher the stakes, the rougher the play. Next. So when, building, when Boeing builds airliners, that's a tongue twister, it is rough play involving very high stakes and thus high risk. Yet Boeing did it very well for many decades. And I give some examples here. The 737 ought to be in that list, but we'll add it. Next. So how did Boeing do this? Well, Boeing had a lot of money, a lot of people, and a lot of machines. Next. But Boeing also had a secret weapon, the culture that held all these assets together, a culture like a family in spite of crises, like business downturns and et cetera, et cetera. Next. Culture is a form of capital. Any company that manufactures something is large and complicated as a jet. Airliner forms a complex human web of knowledge. Next. If you take this, whoops, one, one back here, yes. If you take this <laughs> cultural capital and you are led by a technical maestro, and Alan Mulally is certainly an example of that. Um, next. You get something like this, the Boeing 777. The Boeing 777 was a beautiful example of precise engineering. Here was a plane which was one of the first to be completely designed on a computer. And uh, I forget how far the disks would uh, stretch, but basically something like the moon. <laughs> Next. All right, so the, back to this human web of knowledge and competence. It's fragile and may degrade under rough handling. I, you need to take this into consideration. It will degrade under rough handling. Next. So if you interfere with this culture of human competence, bad things can happen. Next. And at Boeing, this seems to be what happened. After Boeing merged with McDonnell Douglas, the merger caused damage that undercut the web of manufacturing know-how. Next. And here we see how that merger came about. So here it's on the left, Carl Condit of Boeing, who's listening uh, very, with intent to uh, Harry Stonecipher of McDonnell Douglas. So you can see how this is going to go. Next. So Boeing's culture went out the door. Its aircraft maestro, Alan Mulally, went to Detroit, or he went to work for Ford. Next. Meanwhile, Harry Stonecipher, McDonnell Douglas, soon became the new CEO of Boeing. Under him, the culture rapidly declined. Next. Stonecipher wanted a new culture, from family to teams whatever that means. Next. 
So that. <laughs> So one employee told Harry Stonecipher, my God, Harry, don't you know you're changing the culture of Boeing? Stonecipher leaped into the air. This is what he said. He said, my God, he said, that's what we want to do. Next. So that's what Stonecipher did. But was it a good idea to do it? What culture was being replaced? And what would take its place? Next. Randy, next. <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, suppose that Boeing's great accomplishments had only been possible thanks to its culture, which is what I believe. What was this culture? Next. Boeing's employees described it as being like a family, but this culture was actually a high cooperation, generative culture. Next. Yet Stonecipher was not happy with Boeing, this Boeing culture for making planes. He wanted the culture focused on making money. Next. So the generative culture got replaced by a bureaucratic culture. Next. But the former culture had been the key to Boeing's success. So as the stock price of uh, Boeing's went up, the value of its technical product fell. Next. So this was reflected in the planes that Boeing designed and built. The Dreamliner was beautifully designed, but it was messed up with battery problems and other manufacturing issues. Next. Stonecipher, meanwhile, left Boeing in 2005 after an ethical violation, by the way. Other CEOs followed, but success did not return. Next. Then Boeing made a more serious mistake. It put fatal flaws in a new airliner. The new 737 MAX had major defects. Next. This airliner had to work, but it didn't. The 737 MAX had a new MCAS software installed that created, the, created unexpected motions. This is a perfect example of a latent pathogen, as we say in the accident business, a latent pathogen. Pilots should have been trained for the new software, but they were not. The full toolkit of the knowledge to operate the plane was not supplied. Next. One US pilot after suffering from MCAS problems said, I am left to wonder, what else don't I know? The flight manual, he said, is inadequate and almost criminally insufficient. This is an American pilot, by the way. Go ahead. If culture breaks down, things get missed. No maestro and a messed up culture, you could be flying without a parachute. Next. And unfortunately, what this means in practice is that the, the flaws in the 737 MAX soon led to two crashes, killing 345 people. Next. A broken culture had led to a broken airliner project and huge reputational loss, which took years to repair. Next. So what are the lessons we learned from this story? Next. The most obvious one is that you, if you have a working culture, don't mess with it. And if your culture is not working, you better find out how you can fix it. Next. And if you don't know whether your culture is working or not, shouldn't you find out? Next. Thank you for listening. Let's see if anybody has any questions for Dr. Westrom about culture and information flow. So let's start with uh, how do you assess the, how do you assess your culture? How do you figure out whether it's working or not. Right, the, the simplest answer to that is that you you have a questionnaire and the questionnaire basically re recapitulates the points that I mentioned in the slides. And it, it asks, you know, where to, you know, how do you handle innovation? How do you handle uh, sharing between departments? Um, basically, do you feel psychologically secure and so forth? And uh, 
uh, after every talk that I gave at an aviation meeting where I brought these things up, I asked people to to write on the back of a card, what is your corporate culture? And uh, <laughs> uh, I must say that for aviation, the aviation business, uh, the, the picture was not good. Uh, quite often, uh, you know, there was a sizable minority that had, for instance, pathological cultures. Uh, the great majority had bureaucratic cultures. And of course, there were a few that had a generative culture. But um, that's using a, a questionnaire is the simplest way to get at it. And um, so it's interesting to see. I think the Cerner Center might well want to know <laughs> what its own culture is like. Go ahead, Brandy. Yeah. Maybe we can conduct a, a poll sometime and see how see how everybody's feeling uh, about about where our culture is. Wh which one do you think it is? Uh, you can drop it in the comments too if you want. So beyond that, um, you talked a lot about the maestro concept. Is that a requirement for a generative culture? No, it isn't. Um... But maestros tend to bring with them a generative culture because that's how they get information to to flow. Now, von Braun is a perfect example of generative culture, and von Braun emphasized information flow. He he felt that the most important thing for the rocket team to be successful was that everybody communicates well, and he actually had something. But I think this is when he was still uh, at uh, the Redstone Arsenal. He had something called the Monday letter, which literally in one page summarized what each of the different teams at the center was doing. So the interesting thing about that is that this forced the people who were head of these teams to ask their pe people what they were doing. So information tended to flow up. And because everybody got the entire newsletter, they could also see what the other teams were doing. So this this whole attitude was basically, we want to find out what's going on and, you know, you need to know as a member of this large, highly cooperative system. I think it's great. Um, yeah. uh, other, go ahead. No, you go ahead. So other technical maestros uh, have been involved in, you know, major war projects, uh, all sorts of uh, a space pro pro uh, program is a particularly complicated thing. Um, but in World War II, there were a number of these people in the United States who basically helped move ahead the United States toward uh, technical success. Um, Henry Kaiser was a perfect example of this. I can't remember the chap who, who built the uh, bomber factory, which is down the, the road from me, where they built uh, B-24s. Uh, but that factory was a mile long. If you didn't communicate, the planes were never going to come out the, the other end, but they did. And the B-24 was a very important bomber because it, it was the bomber that could address the mid-Atlantic gap uh, where it was often difficult to protect ships against submarines. Go ahead, Brandy. Um, so what can people who are not necessarily in leadership positions do to help generate a generative culture? Well, that's a tough one. Uh, because leaders are actually key to having this stuff work. Um, but I think if you're a team leader, something like that, that's, you know, that's a very good place to, in, to employ some of these skills. Um, getting a generative culture is, if I could tell you in, to, how to do it in five minutes, I could make a bundle. <laughs> it's, often, it's, it's often something that's a top-down thing. Um, but what, the interesting thing is we look if, if we look at organizations and we look at different departments, we find that different departments have different cultures. And even in organizations that are awful, I won't give you examples because I'd get in trouble. But if you look at organizations that are awful, even in these organizations, there's some departments that are actually able to do a generative thing. And the nice thing about it is that generative skills are trainable skills. And helping people communicate, helping people trust, and so forth. Uh, let's deal with this issue of trust for a moment. I pardon me taking a digression here, but this is something that's very important: is that trust is built by keeping promises. 
if you want to if you want to know what builds trust, that's what builds trust. If people keep their promises and the walk matches the talk, that's great. And everybody can basically do that. I mean, this is the simplest way to build the faith and trust of other people. On the contrary, if you decide, you know, if you're going to take advantage of people, trust can vanish. And when trust vanishes, the flow of information goes down. Um, I have a in the book I'm writing, basically, there is a, uh, a, a section devoted to pathological organizations. And there's a whole variety of ways that you can interfere with trust. Uh, I think many people, unfortunately, have experienced virtually all of them. Um, I remember my former wife had worked in three organizations, one after another, which are all pathological environments. <laughs> and you thought, it really can't, there can't be another one, but there seemed to be quite a lot of them. Um, but the ability to build trust is something that comes when you essentially you do what you say you're going to do and you listen to people and you reward the people who deserve to be rewarded. Organizational justice is a huge part of this, huge part of it. That's it. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to digress. Can you talk more about organizational justice? Yes. What that means? Organizational justice is, I mean, the simplest way of saying basic organizational justice is that the people who do the good things get rewarded for doing the good things. Uh, what, the quickest way to create a pathological culture is to decide you're going to reward your friends rather than the people who've actually done the work. And people, uh, if they are subjected to this sort of uh, false attribution, uh, quickly decide that you know, the organization is not going to help them and it's not worthwhile to be good because nobody's going to notice. Good leaders notice what their troops have done and they respond to them. And that's absolutely key. So here, I mean, here in a nutshell, that's the basic thing for organizational justice. But organizational justice also has to do with the way that you go about solving problems. In a pathological organization, you look for somebody to punish. In a bureaucratic organization, you're fair and just, but just fair and just. In a generative organization, you try to figure out what the basic problem is and you get rid of the problem rather than beating on people. Yeah, I think it's a, something that we talk about a lot here is how do we, how do we facilitate good retrospective behaviors and not look for people to, to pin blame on. Uh, there, there's a question about your, your new book. What is your new book about? My new book is about information <laughs> flow. I'm trying to, to basically use a series of case studies, um, many of which I worked on for years, basically trying to um, understand how pathological environments begin and grow. Uh, and they, of course, begin to grow around pathological people because leaders who need power and enjoy punishing other people rise to the top in some organizations. And when they do, then the people who are rising to the top are going to be the people like that, because that's the behavior that's rewarded. Similarly, in, in bureaucratic organizations, which many of us tend to consider our organizations bureaucratic, um, people who abide by the rules and sort of keep their head down and so forth, you know, they, they're the ones that get promoted. Um, in generative organizations, they actively look for people who are going to be the leaders, the people that people respect. You create a culture of good judgment. A culture of good judgment is a culture which respects expertise. And in the Sidewinder book, I looked at the China Lake, which is a huge naval uh, weapon center, still going. Um, and what I noticed about that organization is that everybody understood who knew what. And the ability to understand people's capabilities and also to respect expertise where it was located, that's the kind of thing that allows you to do a great technical job because you can use the best ideas that people have rather than the ideas of people who are favored or people who have the loudest voice and uh, it's a it's a lovely thing to see. When I when I started doing the study, I remember the I talked to a former 
associate technical director and he said, you know, he said, you, you, you know, he said, you can't possibly get this right. <laughs> so I talked to him for a couple hours and after a couple hours, he remembered what it had been like. And he said, you know, this is so good. He said, we need to, you know, you need to go forward with your book. You need to write it, tell a story and so forth. So I tried to tell a story of these people who did these amazing things. And I suppose are still doing amazing things. Yeah. Uh, so this one's a kind of a harder one, I think. Good. Um, is there is there a point of no return from a culture perspective? Um, I suppose you mean if it's pathological. Yes. <laughs> okay. There's a good answer to that, and that is you change the leader. Um, the, there's a book called "It's Your Ship," S H I P. Okay, uh, and this is this is a lovely book. Uh, it's your ship. The captain. Uh, Michael Abershoff replaces a captain who is a pathological leader. And all the crew has stories about how bad the leaders were and all sorts of bad jokes about, I, I, I can't say them over the system here, <laughs> but, but uh, about what their, what their captains were like. So Abershoff decided that he was going to change the way things worked. And at the end of his tour, it would be a very different story than at you know the end of the previous guy's tour where the when the guy got off the previous guy got off the ship all the sailors cheered okay <laughs> they were glad to see him go <laughs> okay so Abershoff decided his tour was going to be different and he and it was different um the first thing he did was he interviewed the entire crew he was on a destroyer okay 345 people something like that big big number um and he did he went through and he interviewed the crew he forced the officers to behave more like members of the crew than, um, you know, people in power. Uh, he trained everybody to do two or three different jobs. So they had a lot of empowerment. He gave them the opportunity to show what they could do. His ship won the Spokane Trophy, which is um, given out by the Navy for the best ship in the Pacific Fleet. This ship became the best ship in the Pacific Fleet. And even after Abershoff left the next year, the ship won the Spokane Trophy again, which showed you that the culture lasted, okay, for a while anyway. Um, so yes, you can, <laughs> you can change it, but sometimes you need to change the top guy or gal, because sometimes the people who are running things, they like it that way. Go ahead. I think it's a, I think it's a really interesting point, and I think one that will probably resonate with people here. I think we've <laughs> got, uh, we've had a lot of change, but I think that uh, the the general thought is that we're trying to head in a better direction. Was there anything from? <laughs> uh, key points from your second slides that we don't have. Uh, are there things from those that yeah. uh, we should make sure we keep in mind? Absolutely. Um, so in the second second set of slides, I talked about um, three different concepts that are all basically uh, close together. And I think, in, you know, basically have the, the nub of the, the important factor that I was emphasizing in the first. The first idea was from William James, a famous psychologist, and it was called the will to believe. Okay, so James felt that people who had a strong sense of something that was true were able to change things be because they believed it. The fact of believing something allowed you to do it. Okay, this, you can see how this related to airliners. The second guy was Enrico Fermi, and he talked about the will to think. The will to think, he said, was something that happened when you knew that whatever project you put forward was actually going to be developed. So the will to think was what allowed him to develop atomic power, which he did at the University of Chicago in the 1940s. Um, my father, by the way, was part of that effort. So um, I'm very, you know, this is a very important example for me. But the third thing was Felton Earls at Harvard came up with this concept of collective 
efficacy. I'm going to do this again. Collective efficacy, because that's not a, you know, it's not a simple thing to say. Collective efficacy is when a group feels that if it works together, it can achieve miracles. Okay. So collective efficacy was studied in a famous study of Chicago neighborhoods. Neighborhoods with high collective efficacy tended to have less crime, uh, were more able to do things that other people weren't. But this is something that every organization should strive for. Collective efficacy allows you to act together as a team because you think as a team you can do things that you know otherwise cannot be done. And certainly the Sidewinder project was a perfect example of believing in what you're doing and believing that as a team you could get this together. The Sidewinder was a underfunded, tiny project, and they were up against huge companies like Hughes Aircraft that had hundreds of engineers working on their missile. And I remember one of the Sidewinder engineers had to comfort the aerodynamicist who, who went to Hughes and he was wowed by all the technical expertise. And so how he said to him, he said, look, he said, the thing about this is that we have a really good design and we have a really good team and we have a really good leader in Bill McLean who solves every problem we come up with in about 10 minutes. He said, Hughes doesn't have a chance. <laughs> so this is an example of collective efficacy. You know, when everybody believes basically that you can do it. And as William James suggested basically, I think 100 years ago um, or, or more, uh, the will to believe is an important thing because it allows you to do the things that otherwise you can't do, okay? What is it that gives people the confidence that they can do those things? All right, that's what you need to look for in leaders, okay? Who is it that can give people the confidence that they can accomplish miracles, basically? And of course, the Sidewinder was an extremely successful project. It became the model for guided missiles, for air-to-air -air guided missiles for basically countries both friendly and unfriendly to the United States. Um, and of course, you know, this was something that constantly had to fight for its existence against bureaucratic stringencies. I remember being in the historian's office and she pointed out a, a row of books. She said, those are all the regulations they passed after we did things. She said, every time we did something, they passed another regulation so we couldn't do it again. Yes, I think we're all super familiar with, with regulations. <laughs> <laughs> they hit us all the time. Right. Um, <laughs> So, uh, as you were talking about collective efficacy, uh, one of the things that occurred to me actually was that sometimes in order for groups to have that sense of togetherness, there has to be an otherness. Have you found that to be true in any of the studies that you've conducted working with groups and culture? Right. So. In the Sidewinder case, you know, there was no doubt about who the enemy was. It was Hughes Aircraft, you know? and that was an important part of it. But the other part of it was this, is a tremendous sense of responsibility for the people that China Lake served, the pilots, okay? So uh, in this second talk, I, I quoted um, one of the, uh, the associate technical directors. And he gave me a speech about what he was doing and why he was doing it. And he said something as follows. He said, the thing is, he said, if you wanted to make a lot of money, you didn't come and work for the government out in China Lake, which is, by the way, in the middle of the Mojave Desert, okay? He said, if you wanted to make a lot of money, you went somewhere else. But if you came here, you got a chance to make a difference for the people who counted. He said, when the pilots would go out to Vietnam, the, the flight group leaders would come here and we would train them by telling them all the things we knew about the missile. We to, told them all the ways this might save their lives, and so forth. And he said, then there would be another day where these commanders would come back and they would tell us how the stuff that we gave them saved their lives. So he said, this isn't a monetary reward. This is one of the richest re rewards you can have. 
because you saved their lives. And that sense of meaning that comes from having done a good job for the people who are your clients is unbeatable. And so, you know, here's a perfect example of how you need to think about the motivation for what you're doing. And um, I, I was absolutely delighted, by the way, to find out that they had in the co commanding officers uh, on his wall, uh, something from uh, basically uh, Scotty in Star Trek. And it said, you were right about the dilithium whatever, dilithium crystals. <laughs> Thank you, China Lake, for doing a good job. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, that's. I think that makes our second Star Trek reference in this talk. <laughs> and your first picture, I think, was from Discovery, the show. Oh, okay. So Star Trek Discovery. Well, now, now you know. <laughs> now you can go catch up on on your Star Trek uh, watching. I think that. Um, I actually think that's a great note to wrap up on. Just the idea okay. that, you know making a difference in this idea that you you need to be committed to what you're trying to accomplish as a group is really really great any final thoughts on that point before we tell our audience goodbye <laughs> um i think that's a good that's a good point to leave on i think that um you need to realize that there is actually an arc of faith between you and your customer and uh this was very important in Grumman Aircraft, for instance, which I also mentioned in the second talk, um, because they always knew how well they were doing. They sent people in World War II, they sent people out to the Pacific to find out how their planes were performing. And when they designed the new ones, they designed it according to what the pilots told them. That arc right. of faith is something you need to have. Perfect. It's, it's my All pleasure right. to talk to you folks and uh, good luck. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been wonderful chatting with you as well.